Okay, so good afternoon, uh, possibly good morning, good evening, depending on where you are from uh, joining us from around the world. Um, my name is Laura Clifford. I'm the Senior Executive Manager of Fintech Fusion. Um, I'll talk a little bit more about that in a couple of minutes, but I'd like to welcome you all to the Innovation Value Institute's webinar um, on mobility and pay tech. It's one of a series of webinars that the IVI is hosting this year. Um, an innovative way to stay in touch and keep connected um, and, and keep the conversations going in the midst of the uh, global pandemic. Um, so I'd like to welcome you all here. And before we get started, I'd like to just cover off a little piece of housekeeping um, just to make everybody aware that this session is being recorded. So in, in keeping with GDPR compliance, we are recording this session, um, but that's to make it available for people who perhaps would like to either recap on any of the items that are discussed or access the um, webinar at a later date. Um, and also I'm going to talk through now the agenda for today. Um, so we will start off, obviously I'll be making a few opening remarks. Um, I'll then hand over to the first of our three speakers. Um, that will be Professor Marcus Helfert from Maynooth University, uh, followed by Declan Fay from Mobica, and then Thomas Norman from Mia Wallet. Um, at the end of each of the speaker's presentations, we will have a Q&A session. So I'd ask you maybe just to keep your questions till the end of the three speakers' um, uh, presentations. And you will notice just on the bottom right of your screen, for those of you on Zoom, that um, there is a Q&A function. So we'd ask that you might put your questions through that, and then I can address those to the panelists at the end of the session. So just um, moving into um, the topic today, as I said, it's payments and mobility. Um, I suppose it's a, it's a very di different mobility ecosystem that we're facing into the future um, with pressure on urban mobility, pressure on the environment, sustainability. And people want convenience, they want personalization, they want connectivity within their mobility and transport and payments. Um, is at the, payments is at the heart of all that. Um, just a little bit of background about me. I, as I mentioned, I'm the Senior Executive Manager of Fintech Fusion, which is a research program at the Adapt Research Centre, um, led out of Trinity College in partnership with Maynooth University, DCU, UCD, TU Dublin and other universities, um, funded by Science Foundation Ireland. Um, and Fintech Fusion looks at fintech and research in that space under three pillars, payments, insurance and um, regulation technology. Um, Marcus, who's joining us here and presenting, is the lead uh, investigator on the payments um, pillar. And um, he is also uh, a professor in Maynooth University. Um, and I'm just going to get this title right. He's the Professor of Digital Service Innovation. So very much aligned to the topic of today's um, presentation. He's also the director of the Innovation Value Institute. So Marcus will give us the academic perspective on payments and mobility and the future of uh, payments and mobility. Um, and then joining us, we have Declan Fay. And Declan is the VP of Strategic Business Development at Mobica. So Mobica is a global software services company delivering enabled technologies to transform business outcomes. And this aligns really well with the research that Marcus does focusing on business uh, process innovation. And then final, our final uh, speaker, but by no means least, is Thomas Norman, who is the COO and co-founder of Mia Wallet. Um, we are all very familiar with digital wallets, uh, with our smart devices um, and the different providers and platforms that we use. So Mia Wallet are a digital payment solution um, for banks and merchants and specifically payment tokenization um, and the implementation of Apple, Google, Fitbit or, Fitbit or any other uh, payment um, wallet that you wish to implement. Um, so without further ado, I'm going to um, move into uh, our first speaker. I'm going to ask Marcus um, if you'd like to share your slides. Um, and as I said, if you have questions, please feel free to submit them in the Q&A box on the bottom right of the screen. Um, and we will move ahead with Marcus's presentation. Thank you. So now it should work. Just a little bit over. Is that okay? Yeah, that's fine, Marcus. Okay, perfect. So also from my side, um, welcome to the Innovation Value um, webinar uh, today. 
uh, on payment systems and mobility systems. And thanks, Laura, for the introduction. So my name is Marcus Helfert. I'm a professor at Maynooth University around digital services, digital service innovation, and broadly digital transformation. And um, together with Laura and the ADAPT uh, Research Center, we're working on the FinTech Fusion spokes. Um, with, as Laura said, uh, three kind of key pillars uh, on regulation technology, uh, insurance technology, and one particular one, uh, payment technology and payment services um, in the broad area of fintech. Um, and uh, so, so I'm leading at that work. And when we talked a little bit, I do a lot of work in smart cities and mobility. Uh, and over the last couple of months, we looked into this, that actually the mobility ecosystems is actually underpinned by uh, payment and uh, payment services. And so we thought it's a really good combination if you're looking at the uh, innovative mobility ecosystems on the one side, and actually how innovative payment services and how payment services uh, look like within that new ecosystems uh, for the next couple of years. So we, we talked about the uh, kind of 2025 um, mobility ecosystems um, uh, around that. So maybe two, three sentences on my background. So um, I'm uh, like between that space, between the business aspects and uh, the computing aspects. So the application of digital technologies in various areas, smart cities, um, also rural development, mobility, and, and, that, and I'm looking at the data management. Um, uh, so I do a lot of work uh, around smart cities, where we're looking at the, the cities not only from a technical perspective, but we're looking at the cities as uh, a network of various stakeholders, various enterprises, various entities within that, and uh, a, a value creating uh, network. So it's basically a complex network of uh, services, service systems. And uh, when you think about Dublin or Limerick, where we do a, a large project, uh, it is truly a complex systems with also different objectives, um, different domains. Mobility is one of them, energy is another one, but also, of course, well being, quality of life. Um, um, uh, all the public services uh, are part of this. And that makes it extremely complex to shape a mobility service. So it's not only just transportation from A to B, it's also about uh, the innovation, um, the economic growth, but also uh, the, the comfortability, uh, the customer expectations. So there are lots of different objectives and various viewpoints on the same thing, on a thing, for example, as smart cities. And of course, if we go into kind of a more regional aspect, so if you take, for example, the Dublin uh, region, um, where Kildare, for example, Manuf University, be part of this, um, uh, then, of course, it becomes more complex, lots of different um, uh, types of transportation modes or possibilities around that. So it doesn't become just one silo on mobility. It becomes actually aspects of all the different domains which we would consider in, in a smart city. So furthermore, it's not only just about technology on transportation or technology on payment. It also, of course, involves people, actors, enterprises, and that social aspects around the, the smart city. So we're talking about social technical systems. So it's always people and technology, and that, that's argumented and, and worked uh, together. And that makes it, of course, extremely complex, complicated, uh, to organize that, to understand that, to understand such an ecosystem and how technology and that digital transformation can actually change and shift uh, uh, that, that smart cities. So it also involves, of course, um, uh, transportation, goods and, and physical things, but it also uh, has a lot of intangible uh, values and creation, innovation, and this quality of life uh, uh, aspect. So it becomes a really service uh, network around it. So it's not just basically on uh, a, a tangible aspect. It has a lot of other things in it as well. Furthermore, of course, the cities evolve and these networks, these ecosystems evolves and they um, um, often by enabled by technology, but also by um, a social aspects or even uh, the recent pandemic, the recent crisis around COVID, all this. So 
uh, things changing and it's highly dynamic. So what, what we have now is a complex socio-technical system that is dynamic uh, and it involves many different stakeholders, many different networks, sub-networks in that. And that's what we are dealing with and that's what the, the fundamental aspect of my research is and what I'm interested in is to shaping, to understand how to transform, how that digital transformation works within that ecosystem, how technologies, how innovation and technologies can help to provide that in a better way. So in this case, how to provide a really truly mobility service, which actually works, um, which is comfortable, which is actually kind of uh, responding to the customer uh, expectations and the, the, the needs around mobility. But on the other side, of course, also which is efficient, which is affordable, um, which shares, for example, the different transportation modes and which is really truly integrated around that. And even just like these four or five criteria around what maybe a mobility service, a mobility system looks like, of course, that's not an easy task. Uh, to organize. And that's where we started about uh, at least 12 months ago, where we started on the future of mobility and the future of mobility and payment uh, ecosystems and services, how that actually shapes and looks and what can we do, how can transformation paths, how can we actually enable that and, and starting basically to shape such a, a system. However, we also know that, of course, the mobility system, the mobility ecosystems will look quite different than what we have at the moment. So we need to think about maybe the, the technology trends which are emerging and Thomas, like uh, your presentation on the payment uh, systems and the, the trends around that. Of course, uh, the payment systems and, and the new payment uh, methods will impact how we use mobility, how we pay for it, how the revenue model is actually shaped around it. And uh, also on the technical side, of course, like uh, the autonomous cars, uh, e-cars, um, also ticketing systems and locking in how, how we open and, and how we use that. All of this will shape and impact how the mobility ecosystem in the future looks like. We don't know exactly how it looks like, but we can identify uh, certain trends. And that's hopefully what also comes out of this webinar, that we at least to kind of picture the, 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 the future mobility ecosystems, what is possible, how do we actually uh, want to have it shaped around it, how these trends look like that this comes out of this webinar uh, uh, around it. But what we know is actually that customers um, like to have a fast, reliable, convenient, and hopefully a personalized a mobility experience, so much more like a, a mobility as a service than owning an individual car. So basically uh, to have these kind of characteristics around the mobility service, which is uh, available to um, a move from A to B or actually have that uh, um, 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 a service around that. So, um, and it moves away from that individual mobility to much more personalized, to much more mobility uh, as, a, as a service. So, of course, Ireland is not uh, the only place where transportation is challenging um, and also where transportation, mobility research and, and aspects are done. There's a huge um, uh, part in, on, on the EU side on uh, EU funding uh, programs, also um, uh, on, on incentivization and, and looking at that and frameworks around it. And also there is a lot of data around it. So basically these examples, what I have here are some statistics. There's a whole portal on transportation data. It's quite interesting actually to look at that. Um, so, uh, and there's a rich uh, information around it. I think we are not short on knowing the current state of the transportation mobility area and on the other side on some trends, but bringing it all together, I think this is still uh, extremely challenging. And there's of course also like this report here on uh, current trends on issues. So that was published last year in 2019 uh, around this. So I don't think uh, too much has changed uh, since that. Uh, so this is for each country, uh, a report of the current trends and issues around uh, transportation. And of course, uh, being in Ireland, uh, I look then how the Irish um, description of this um, report looks like. Um, and it, it is quite interesting then um, to just looking also at the figures that uh, 250 million passenger journeys 
were just done um, in the, the bus operators here and 16 million passenger journeys. So it's actually a huge uh, um, ecosystems with mobility uh, uh, around this. Uh, and and of it, it's expected that it's not decreasing, it will actually uh, increase. And if we continue like what we actually have at the moment, of course, these serious concessions and public transport uh, issues, um, um, they, they will increase. And uh, so we need to have some changes. So there's no doubt on that to organize at least the mobility in the dense, in the populated uh, areas, in the urban areas. Uh, in, a, in a different way. So this is what all these reports uh, show that it will increase and uh, the numbers are um, um, massive uh, around that. Um, one aspect which I found in that EU report as well, um, also uh, uh, um, in Ireland, so uh, the quality of the transportation infrastructure. It's not the transportation service, but the infrastructure, and that's probably a representation around it. Uh, so, first of all, I think Ireland doesn't rank very high on, on this, so somewhere in the, in the 30 places in the world ranking, so it's not too bad. Uh, but what I find interesting is this one here. So that basically since 2015, and it might have to do with uh, some increase in transportation, that uh, the, um, uh, the, the share of the renewable energy in transportation uh, is actually decreasing. So uh, that's quite interesting. So all the, the trends would expect that basically the renewable energy uh, is increasing. And of course, this is not only the, 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 the private uh, transportation, I think this is the whole um, uh, transportation sector around it. But it's still, it's an alarming signal that we basically actually have a trend uh, um, um, uh, downwards on the renewable energy and that the quality uh, probably has potential to be improved uh, as, as well. So, and then we looked into, so how future of mobility uh, could look like, and there's also like from one of the big consulting companies talking about the future of mobility 3.0. And uh, so it, it's, it's an area of disruption, changes, and also innovation, creativity uh, uh, around that. So if you want to solve and address at least part of these challenges and make a reliable uh, uh, transportation mobility service uh, uh, around that. So we need to be quite innovative and we need to use the information which we have on passengers uh, um, uh, demands and also uh, making the transportation system much more flexible, much more responsive on uh, different um, um, uh, demand patterns uh, around that. Also, what I certainly believe in is also that behavioral change is an important aspect on that as well, and that information can help a lot to direct a certain behavior or a certain mobility uh, um, uh, demand around that, so that information can help actually to change the demand patterns, maybe the peak times uh, uh, around that. So we actually can reinvent. Uh, uh, reinventing uh, the mobility area so we can change that and that's where we are at the moment and that's why that webinar I think is hopefully giving some um, in interesting parts uh, uh, around that so uh, because uh, it will increase and it will increase the pressure on the mobility systems and not only in Dublin uh, also when we're working in Limerick with the smart city uh, project it's, it's, it's very similar challenges. Uh, also, there are some uh, rankings and, and statistics about uh, mobility. There's also from, from one of the, the consulting companies, they do an, an annual um, uh, uh, ranking of the mobility uh, aspects around it. And first of all, I didn't find any Irish or, or Dublin um, in, in, in this in, in the, 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 the higher rank um, ones, but also what is interesting, even the, the usually the top uh, smart city ones, um, there's, there's certainly a potential uh, on, on this. So, and they all rank about the same here. Yeah. So there's, there's certainly like what they say is um, uh, that the average city unleashes less than half of the potential of its urban mobility system. So certainly there's possibility to, to improve all over in all the cities in the, in, uh, um, uh, around mobility. So in my opinion, the mobility system of the 
tomorrow looks different. That's not surprising. But I think uh, digitalization and also the seamless payment uh, uh, aspects and the, the seamless payment uh, system underpins that changes to a true mobility as a service. So um, evolving from ownership, from individual transportation to actually have a mobility system which uses different transportation modes and fully integrate that and also integrates that from a customer perspective that we basically don't have to worry about the different ticketing that are systems that we may be just actually aware of it. Sim more similar like basically what we have in the telecom, in the mobile um, uh, um, environment where we basically use the mobile services now um, um, and um, um, the, the pricing is maybe at some stage a decision, but it's not the individual, the transaction on, on the end. So it's not the individual journey. It's more like really a service which we maybe sign up to and we're using this on a much more integrated and much more flexible um, way. So um, the solution or the ecosystems in the future, they will be certainly much more interconnected between the transportation modes, but also between the, the, the region much more uh, linked together uh, it will be multimodal, so also the individual and the public uh, transportation uh, have a certain um, um, role in, within that ecosystem. And also it will be much more customer oriented, convenient, efficient, flexible uh, to affordable cost. And of course that has aspects and, and questions and, and challenges around revenue sharing, business models, uh, technical challenges, how to integrate all of this and how to use innovation, particular, for example, in the payment uh, um, um, area uh, systems and, and how can we actually uh, um, uh, orient that. So what I did then, I'm, I just typed in into to Google mobility ecosystems. I found, uh, can't see now the number, but a large number of um, diagrams. It's only diagrams, images on uh, mobility ecosystems. Um, and uh, I zoomed into one, I just picked one, which is quite interesting that basically all these different, so it's not only the mobility and the electrical cars, it's other aspects as well, insurance, finance, data. So the ecosystem, the mobility ecosystems looks much more uh, coherent, much more um, uh, with different aspects on it. So that resonates very well to that first diagram what I had about the smart cities, that actually all the actors, all the different stakeholders within that, so uh, starting also with parking, bus system, but particularly also the finance and the payment and insurance and all of these aspects are important. So, and to shape these ecosystems and understand maybe different roles in there and how different roles changes, that's an interesting aspect from the academic side, from the research side. So that's what we're looking into in the Innovation Value Institute, where we're looking at how these ecosystems changing, how different roles are changing and how business models and aspects around that uh, changes uh, and, and to us this is quite interesting and and uh, so what we are looking is basically to architect to design and they the, to looking at these service ecosystems how they actually shape and what we do is we're using architectures descriptions uh, models so similar what you just saw on the previous uh, slide to understand the relationships and the roles within these environments within these complex uh, uh, service environments uh, around it and we or I see that as an engineering approach where we actually can can uh, understand and engineering the configuration the relationships within that and understanding the roles uh, within it of course uh, with information is an important part information connection relationships between that processes so how to configure such an ecosystem that's a fundamental question to myself and and to, to my research team and how to look at the alignment between the technology and the business aspect so that the technology enables certain changes and supports certain changes and that we get to this uh, future um, mobility ecosystem which works for all, which responds to customer expectations and uses and ways of technology uh, innovation. So uh, I, I leave it to that. So um, I wanted to give a few kind of um, pointers to, to think about it and I'm looking forward to the discussion in this webinar or also uh, later in, in various collaborations but I think uh, we enter an exciting time around um, uh, 
the mobility area where the mobility certainly looks different, but how does it look like and what opportunities we have resulting from it? So that's a, one of the key questions um, which, which I'm interested in and uh, which I think is important to shape this, this ecosystem. That's great. Thank you, Marcus. And you're actually bang on time. You can tell you're a professional presenter. Um, I was really well wait for um, our next speaker. I just wanted to make a couple of comments on what you've of what you've shared there. I was really uh, interested in your ecosystem mapping. Um, you know that that to me is something that resonates with the type of work we're doing in the in Tech Fusion program, of which you're one of the lead uh, PI. An unstable internet connection. I may turn off my video for a second. Apologies if there was a, a, a break in sound, apologies. Um, but what you were describing there about the different actors and the dynamism and the um, complexity of this, of this ecosystem, and it is going to be a, a grand challenge for, for us and, and um, communities and, and countries to manage. But what I found when I took on the role of, of leading the FinTech research program, I had a naive understanding of, of who would be leading these um, transformations in the FinTech space. I, ex I presumed it would be people with financial expertise and people with technology expertise, but it's far broader than that and, and has wider um, reaching implications. Um, where I have come to almost the conclusion that a company will have to make some sort of a payments or um, a fintech type uh, change to their processes. Um, and as you say, people want to do things on the fly. Um, you've talked about the crossover between finance and insurance, for example. Um, I know that from talking to some of our partners who collaborate with us, they're looking at ways of pay as you go for insurance. So you only pay for your insurance as you drive. How do we capture that information? How do we make sure it's fair, transparent, um, compliant, uh, and all of these challenges that are faced? So there, there's going to be far broader ecosystems than just those that I would have naively understood them to be um, at, at the outset. So um, I can see also quite a few questions coming in there on the Q&A. So thank you very much for that. Please keep them coming in. And um, there will be a, a Q&A session at the end. So hopefully we'll get to answer many of those questions. Um, thanks, Marcus, for setting the scene. I'm going to uh, move on, on to our next speaker now. Um, and this is with um, a, a colleague I've been working with for some time now, Declan Faye. Declan and I uh, connected over our love of blockchain um, some time ago. Um, and uh, it's evolved from there. I know Declan is doing great things at Mobic at the moment. Um, and certainly payments and mobility is of, of interest to, to the team at Mobica. So it'd be interesting to hear, Declan, your perception from the industry side um, and the enabling technologies for, for mobility and payments. Sure, Laura, uh, and thanks, um, and thanks, Marcus, for uh, some great insights. Um, maybe just to start, uh, say a little bit about myself. Um, good afternoon, or good morning, good evening, everyone, depending on where you are. Um, thanks to the, the IVI team uh, for for engaging uh, me on this uh, on the discussion today. Uh, it's an exciting area for sure, and an area that that Mobica has uh, considerable involvement in. Uh, for myself, uh, I head up uh, strategic business development uh, at Mobica. Uh, I've been uh, engaged in the tech sector for practically all of my career. I uh, spent a um, considerable amount of time with uh, a number of the big uh, tech multinationals, most recently with, uh, with Intel, uh, where I was heavily involved in IoT product and solution development. I've uh, been with Mobica uh, since uh, November of last year, but I've known of Mobica uh, for quite some time uh, in the industry in terms of the, the engagement and the breadth of engagement that the company has. Um, maybe if I uh, share a little bit, I think my slides are not moving on. There we are. Yes, so hopefully everybody can see my slides. Uh, a little bit about Mobica, uh, headquartered in Manchester in the UK, uh, been in business for 15 years. Uh, we're essentially a digital product and solutions engineering uh, company with uh, a team of some 800 uh, highly skilled engineers. Uh, the company's uh, original uh, heritage would have been in mobile, uh, uh, very quickly pivoted into embedded, uh, and in more recent times, our capabilities have evolved to uh, digital platforms. So, uh, you know, as it describes on the right, uh, essentially we provide uh, digital consulting and full stack software engineering for digital transformation. Um, you can see our 
global locations uh, indicated on the on the map on the left. Um, I guess just a little bit about our vertical sector and technology engagement. Uh, we've had significant uh, involvement in the, the silicon industry and the automotive industry for some time, uh, built up around uh, strong embedded capabilities. Uh, that has evolved in recent times to be a little bit broader. We address silicon and technology platforms, uh, and then automotive and intelligent mobility. And then everything else, which is kind of broad, broad market, uh, we would classify as uh, connected uh, and intelligent solutions. Uh, and from a technology focus perspective, uh, we're, we're obviously um, still heavily involved in traditional software development and, and test. Uh, but over the last number of years, we've become increasingly involved in areas like uh, artificial intelligence, machine learning, computer vision, uh, IoT and advanced uh, UX technologies. Uh, so for the conversation today, I guess, you know, be drawing on our uh, market and industry insights or technology insights from these particular areas uh, within the portfolio uh, of sectors that, that we address uh, and also drawn from, from research uh, sources and consulting sources as well. So, uh, so let me move, move forward and, and uh, spend a little bit of time talking about the challenges and, and opportunities uh, from an industry perspective. Uh, interestingly, uh, traditional banking, financial services and insurance and automotive uh, have a, a similar and shared story uh, in terms of how the respective industries are, are trending. Uh, if you think about traditional BFSI, um, legacy systems, uh, many still running on mainframe, for example, uh, designed and built for high volume secure transaction processing. Uh, for automotive, clearly the legacy is in powertrain and body engineering. Uh, and uh, increasingly the challenge for the automotive sector is uh, around lacking in, in software skills. Um, and then the sources of disruption I suppose on the fintech side or on the, the banking financial services side, uh, you have challenger banks, uh, fintech, uh, developments like real-time uh, account transfer, uh, mobile payments. On the automotive side, electrification has been the source of a, a significant disruption. And then, of course, the big tech platform players uh, have uh, made significant and early investment in key technologies like computer vision and AI. Uh, so three uh, sources, big tech platforms, uh, innovative startups and, and new entrants, um, disruptive business models, uh, for example, everything as a service. These factors have uh, created significant turbulence uh, in these industries uh, and both are struggling to, to respond to the changes. Um, uh, I suppose if you think about, uh, of course, it's, it's, it's obvious to say that it's important to respond, uh, but the graphic here, uh, I suppose, just makes, uh, from, from an automotive perspective, at least in any case, it, it kind of shows the, the size of the challenge. Um, you, you know, the important thing here is not so much the numbers, uh, but the relativity. Uh, I guess, between the numbers, and it's, it's showing market cap and cash for uh, two of the big uh, tech players and two of the big automotive players. Uh, and you can see uh, from this that this is quite a stark challenge because if you have that kind of market strength and that kind of, of uh, uh, revenue flow and cash, available cash, then your ability to continue to invest in innovation and technology development uh, far uh, outstrips uh, traditional industries. Uh, and that is, is a significant challenge uh, in, in automotive. Um, the competitive landscape has changed uh, utterly, uh, I guess, and, and, and will continue to, but the past landscape looked quite simple. It was OEM versus OEM, uh, supported by uh, the tier ones or the, the tier minus ones, if you like. Um, you know, big players like Bosch and, and, and Conti and the likes. 
uh, the future competitive landscape uh, looks quite a bit different because you have, of course, OEM versus OEM, uh, but you have uh, Chinese uh, automotive players like SAIC, uh, one of the fastest growing uh, OEMs uh, globally uh, over the last couple of years. Uh, you have new entrant uh, OEMs like Tesla, who are digitally native. Uh, and that's, that's where the growth is. Uh, and then, of course, big tech and mobility as a service. Um, that probably is leading to some squeeze on the tier ones and, and some of the tier minus ones. Um, but the combination of, of a, 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 a radically changing competitive landscape and challenges in terms of the, the sort of a fiscal situation in the business and the ability to invest in new tech is, is, is a real challenge. Uh, what is a positive uh, for the automotives, however, is that uh, in terms of buyers and the sentiment around trust and loyalty, uh, buyers would still uh, feel a greater level of trust in the automotive players. Um, uh, and this data is, is post Dieselgate, so I, I guess that's, that's a good thing. Uh, and a, a, an important asset that the auto automakers have at their disposal. Um, so the challenges are, 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 are significant for sure, uh, but the disruption offers the OEMs a, a really unique opportunity to expand from uh, selling hardware only to selling uh, features and, and services. Um, Moving on to, to uh, think about uh, Connectus and autonomous vehicle adoption, uh, we look at some of the stats for connected vehicle uh, status today, and this is US data. Uh, the majority of drivers are connected. Uh, most today are device connected. Um, a growing number is uh, car connected, and that's increasing at a, at a higher rate uh, than device connectivity within within the car. Uh, still a significant number are unconnected, uh, given, uh, I suppose, the, the amount of connectivity options available. Um, interesting maybe to think about uh, buyer decisions and the kind of factors that people think about when they're making a, a purchase decision for a car. Uh, safety, uh, as you would expect, uh, tops the list, followed by uh, fuel economy, uh, and interestingly, uh, connectivity is way down the list at 11%. Um, what, what's, what's interesting about this, though, is that there's, a, uh, I suppose, uh, a symbiotic relationship between safety and, and, and connectivity, because safety is the biggest beneficiary uh, of, uh, of connectivity. Uh, so that means that the automakers should have a, a strong uh, selling story around uh, connectivity. Um, and this kind of just shows that the obstacles to growth, the similar picture, safety concerns, uh, a lack of regulatory frameworks, and that's particularly around uh, autonomous vehicles. Um, the fact, uh, however, is that even though all of that connectivity is there, many consumers are, are unaware, uh, and that's because dealers are not selling uh, the value of connectivity in the, the purchase transaction. Uh, and some data on this showed that uh, I think it was close to 70% of uh, buyers in Europe uh, did not uh, get a demo on connectivity. Uh, when making a vehicle purchase, uh, it was something like 60% in the US. And interestingly, uh, more than half of, uh, of buyers in China uh, were actually informed and, and uh, received a demo on, on connectivity. So that suggests that uh, Europe in particular uh, potentially has, uh, has a challenge here. So what we'll see increasingly is uh, this intermediation between the OEM and the buyer, and that's to ensure that, that connectivity uh, and future autonomous capabilities can be more effectively sold, uh, but also to enable the OEMs to have more direct connection with the consumer. Uh, to uh, deliver features, uh, to deliver data-driven uh, services, for example. 
so, so Marcus uh, shared some very interesting insights on the breadth of the um, mobility ecosystem. This looks at it uh, from the context of the uh, payments uh, ecosystem. Um, so all of the things that sit around, you know, traditional payments and traditional automotive, uh, you have everything from, from bike rental and uh, micro mobility to, um, you know, the, the retail landscape, emerging tech like last mile and drones, uh, insurance, uh, and then data suppliers in terms of environmental um, data, uh, traffic data, and the data aggregators that, that bring that together and present it in a useful, uh, in a useful way are, are key players. Uh, in, the, in the automotive space then, you, you know, you have this tension between uh, in-dash uh, connectivity and device connectivity, and that will continue uh, to evolve over time. Uh, some sectors, are, are the researchers suggest, could be you know, quite adversely uh, affected by COVID in the short term. Clearly, we see what public transport is like and how it has changed. Interestingly, e-hailing and ride-sharing, uh, the research suggests that these are areas, uh, because of social distancing, that people might be a little bit more hesitant about than, in, than they would have been uh, pre pandemic. Um, size of the price is, is massive. It's a trillion dollar market in broad mobility. Uh, automotive alone is sized at $230 billion. Uh, so very significant uh, market to be addressed. Uh, and then it's expected that autonomous driving will drive significant uh, additional growth. And we'll talk uh, a little bit more detail on that one in a, in a subsequent slide. Um, so uh, in the next slides, we'll, we'll kind of drill a little bit more uh, deeply into automotive specific in terms of the current landscape and what the future landscape will look like. Um, let me just go ahead and build these out. So uh, most in-car transactions today relate to parking fuel and drive through food or coffee. Uh, click to collect groceries in the context of COVID has become uh, very significant. Uh, most today is via the smartphone, but increasingly uh, moving to in-car connectivity. Uh, and voice uh, assist is the, is the key technology, obviously, for, for safety reasons. Um, it, it, even where users report a higher use of Siri or Alexa in other contexts, uh, Google still leads. So that clearly indicates that navigation is the launch pad currently for in-car commerce. Um, many commuters uh, report that they use regularly use merchant apps to allow uh, purchases that, that avail of loyalty, uh, but the user experience for those apps must be really good or the app gets quickly uh, dropped. Um, so current technologies that are important are things like voice assist, uh, mobile apps and, and payments clearly, uh, connected vehicle, uh, existing uh, networking technologies and the cloud of course, uh, location and navigation, uh, connected vehicle and, and digital cockpit. Uh, looking a, a little bit more to, to the future, uh, autonomous driving and, and vehicle to, to everything uh, connectivity uh, will massively expand the, the landscape for uh, in-car commerce. Uh, as the driver's attention is removed from driving, uh, it creates the, the, the ability and the space for driver to, uh, to engage in, in other activities. Uh, increasing mobile integration and facial recognition technologies will enable new platforms, uh, new forms of user authentication, vehicle access and profiles, um, and commuters can engage in a, in a broad range of activities when commuting using uh, an autonomous vehicle. Just a, a little bit about uh, autonomous vehicles, uh, specifically in terms of adoption. You can see the trajectory here. I think we're, we're all familiar with the different levels uh, involved. Uh, it's expected that by you know, 20, uh, 2021, we're at level three, uh, uh, and that's termed eyes off uh, automation, or significant amounts of automation, at least in the context of motorway driving, uh, can be taken over by the car. 
uh, the timeline uh, for level four and level five is, is quite uncertain because as Marcus highlighted in his uh, presentation, the mobility ecosystem uh, still uh, is challenged and will continue to be challenged by uh, fragmentation. Uh, and that, that is something that will uh, be required to be addressed for these higher levels of automation to take place. However, there are scenarios and use cases where, um, you know, where autonomous clearly will, will flourish in the nearer term. Uh, spaces like airports or, or large industrial uh, spaces, large retail spaces, uh, parks where things like geofencing, for example, uh, infrastructure integration can be more easily controlled because you have one single authority. That would be the space within which uh, autonomous will, will thrive. Uh, you know, so, so autonomous is clearly on the way. Uh, I've included a, a, a use case from a, a, a robo taxi uh, that shows how payments, a payments terminal provider has integrated uh, a seamless touchless uh, payments uh, integration within robo taxi. Uh, I won't play the video, it's a short video of, of a minute or so, but the, the materials will be sent out so uh, folks can, can look at this in, in their own time. Uh, I'll quickly run through just some of the key conclusions and, and wrap it up there. Um, you know, traditional BFSI payments and automotive share a similar story in terms of disruption. Uh, the competitive landscape for OEMs is and will continue to be challenging, but the opportunity is massive. Uh, OEMs uh, will increasingly seek ways of connecting directly to the customers from when bundle features and services at point of sale, uh, and they will increasingly uh, derive revenue from over the year updates, uh, perhaps things like brand merchandise over the vehicle's life, life cycle, for example. Uh, voice enabled in car commerce is a reality today uh, for, for many uh, drivers, particularly those aged between 30 to 40 uh, age group uh, are, are, are taking up uh, in-car voice-enabled transactions in, in a significant way. Navigation as the launch pad uh, gives Google the edge today, uh, but others will certainly come to the fore, uh, like entertainment, like reading, which uh, I suppose we could suspect that that would give Amazon uh, some nice positioning, and others, of course. Uh, autonomous driving is here, but we've talked a little bit about the challenges that will uh, that will need to be overcome to to get to the next levels. Uh, COVID um, massive impact from an, an industrial perspective, at least from a manufacturing and supply chain perspective. But the the overhang will be felt in mobility as a service for some time. Um, autonomous and, and vehicle to everything communication will drive. Uh, massive, uh, massive machine-to-machine -machine commercial activity and in-car commercial activity. Uh, in order for these uh, changes to take place, uh, regulatory and industry collaboration uh, will need to uh, to happen in order to have consumer buy-in regarding safety and cyber security. Um, uh, and finally, I guess the thought that all ecosystem players need to be looking at current and future technologies and partnering for accelerated innovation and development to capture a share of the opportunity. And that's everything that I had, uh, so thank you. Thank you very much, Declan. Again, um, you're, you're all very prompt and, and on time, so I appreciate that, and some really interesting insights there. Um, and thank you also for sharing your email address if, if anyone wants to reach out to you directly and your LinkedIn profile is there as well to discuss these further. I'm sure there's plenty of food for thought there um, for people who might want to evolve that conversation a little bit further with you. Um, before we move on to Thomas, just a, an observation I made, uh, you mentioned um, the demos on connectivity that are being given by car dealers to end users and I wonder if that's uh, a cultural thing. You mentioned China pr probably doing better on that front than other countries around the world. Um, or if it's just the, the fact that people buying the, the bigger, more connected cars are not um, as interested in that as maybe younger generations who would be. Um, but also, Marcus, I know you'd mentioned the need for behavioral change. So I think that that will ultimately be and and the adoption of them, I suppose, in markets global. Um
know that I have a an unstable connection um, to try and manage that a little bit. Um, so just uh, like to invite our next speaker to to um, set up his slides, please. Um, Thomas Tom Norman is the CEO and co-founder of Mia Wallet, and we're all very familiar now, I think, with our um, ability to pay with without using cash and actually moving away from the traditional card. Um, I am uh, an, an Apple Pay person myself. Um, it is to my detriment because it makes things far too easy. It's on my laptop, it's on my phone, it's everywhere. So um, my bills are, are going up uh, in, a, in, a, in a way that I'm not as familiar with as I perhaps should um, because I'm not charged with having to go to an ATM to withdraw cash. Um, it'll be interesting from your perspective, uh, given what Marcus will be underpinning all of these um, transformations and innovations as we move forward in mobility. So interesting to hear what you have to say. So I'll hand over to you now, Thomas. Thank you, Laura. Um, I hope you I hope you'll hear me well. Um, so, uh, so um, um, yeah, I'm, I'm Thomas from Mia Wallet and um, we're a company that since 2013 have been working with digital payments, mobile payments, and we've been doing this since, well, even, even before Apple Pay existed or, or was even announced. Um, and uh, we've been working for the past, past eight years um, with MasterCard, with Visa, with Amex in, um, in defining and, de and deploying the, um, the, new, the new payment technology that we're all seeing and using today. Um, and me and Walla today, we, we provide uh, we provide our technology and our products to uh, uh, just about forty customers, um, actually reaching four continents and, and, and more than twenty countries. So um, so we can truly see that that payments it's a global is a global concern, and, and um, thanks to centralization, it's uh, it's possible for for a Norwegian company to to cover four continents. Um, and what we do at Maya is, is uh, simple put, we're connecting banks, merchants, and wallets. And um, uh, doing this, um, we have been exposed for, for the, the trends that we're seeing in, in, um, in payment that, that um, I will go a bit deeper into in, uh, in this webinar connected to um, automotive and, and mobility. <clears throat> Um, so in Mia Wallet, we we have been talking to customers, prospects, uh, partners. Uh, we've been talking to Visa and Mastercard, and based on this, uh, we have identified four key trends that we see the the payment card industry across Europe, especially, but also globally, um, is affected by. So um, especially. The three of those four key trends, um, I, I believe, is especially relevant for the automotive industry. Um, first, if, if you look at customer experience and, and uh, customer self-service and user control, um, it's become a number one metric, I'd say. Um, <clears throat> and we do see that from other digital platforms that uh, the provider uh, who, who can give the best user experience typically ends up winning. Um, and from my experience, I, I'd say that digital customer experience, it hasn't been the key focus of the automotive industry yet, um, but this is increasingly important in going forward. And, and I think the, uh, the traditional automotive as well as mobility industry is feeling the, the, um, the push from uh, newcomers such as Tesla, who are, are challenging this from a more IT Silicon Valley perspective than from a traditional uh, automotive perspective. Um, and another, another example of, uh, of um, the importance of, of customer experience in, in this industry, I believe is actually Uber. Um, it's, it's quite simple to think that Uber is simply um, an app uh, in order to book a taxi or that they are a platform to provide taxi services. However, um, 
one of the most transformative innovations that, that Uber made was actually to make the payment uh, at the end of a ride to a non-event. Um, in 2009, Uber actually, they made payments disappear um, and, and they created the beginning of what, the, what is today called invisible payments. Um, and, and this has become increasingly important. Today, it's, invisible payments are, are deemed as the holy grail. It's considered one of the most important advances uh, that we have seen, but also will be seeing in payments going forward. And, um, uh, close to uh, close to everyone working with payments today, um, they are working one way or another uh, on the transition um, to digital payments. Uh, it was a one bank I talked to. They told me that it's not a question of if or when, because the answer to that is yes and, and now. The question is simply, how do we make the best solution of it? So the transition to truly digital payments is, is a key trend. And a key part of that is um, uh, it's the enablement of tokenization. Um, just a few years ago, um, EMVCO, an organization, introduced payment card organization. And I, I won't dive into the technical details, but in short, the concept of tokenization is to generate a unique payment token that um, is restricted in how it can be used, whether it's a specific device or a specific merchant or a, a specific transaction type. Um, but from a user perspective, it may be more understandable to talk about Apple Pay and Google Pay because tokenization is the key technology that has enabled digital wallets such as Apple and Google Pay. Um, so, uh, so this is a very, very important uh, initial step um, in the future of um, card payment infrastructure. Uh, what is maybe not that well known is that uh, Amazon, Netflix, and other big merchants, e-commerce merchants, have also uh, jumped us in this. Um, over the past two years, tokenization has been moving to its next phase, focusing on securing and simplifying e-commerce payments. Um, and it's simply the consumers expect the same secure and easy way of performing payments, regardless of channel and device. And by using tokens for remote commerce, typically online or in-app payments, uh, the security does not have to compromise for the user experience. But the third and most relevant step in, uh, in this webinar is, um, uh, is a, a growth of uh, Internet of Things and how uh, tokenization uh, it can help this. Um, Internet of Things have already become a reality. Uh, we've already seen a, a huge growth in connected devices, such as cars, but also refrigerators and, and coffee machines. And it's expected that the Internet of Things will see exponential growth in the coming years. And uh, connected to this growth, uh, the next step for Internet of Things will be the payment of things uh, enabled by tokenization technology. Uh, the payment of things will not only transform the way that we perform payments, but will actually also create new business models and payment capabilities. Uh, because for payment of things, this security is um, one of the fundamentals for success. If your car is going to perform a payment for you or, or the refrigerator is going to uh, perform a payment for you, you need to feel secure that, that um, um, there's no data breach or a hacker can access your, your car details or perform malicious transactions. Um, so tokenization is basically a prerequisite that enables um, the same high security as uh, other payment situations. For instance, when you're paying with your chip card um, in a physical store. And, and what we believe is that this will enable an accelerated growth of um, invisible payments. 
So uh, yeah, simply like what we are already used today when we are driving Uber or ordering things that we don't really need from Alexa. Um, but what, what's also important, and as mentioned a couple of times uh, on today's webinar, is that it's not only the advances in technology or, or payment technology, but it's important to keep in mind that the technology is nothing without user adoption, and that user adoption is heavily dependent on the user experience. So, um, Looking into that, I think one good example um, uh, is from Norway, um, where the Norwegian government have established a company called Entur, uh, whose purpose is to tackle some of the challenges seen in user experience and mobility. So what Entur has done is to look into the problems that occur when you as a consumer want to do a simple thing, such as getting from A to B using public transport. Um, and in, in that situation, the, the consumer world was, were actually facing several issues. Uh, for instance, what is the best or the, the fastest way to get where I want, regardless of transportation method? And um, if that travel includes multiple transportation companies, how much will the trip cost? Where do I go to buy the tickets, etc.? So one thing that uh, that Endur have um, achieved already is that they've been able to connect 18 transportation companies, including, for instance, the British company um, Go Ahead, uh, and also the National Railroad Road Service of Norway and and local um, bus companies. And firstly, they've created a single interface, a uh, travel search that can find the best way of traveling according to the user's own preference. As you can see on the, on the image here, just a screenshot from, um, from their website. Um, and furthermore, they, they've made it possible to order the trip from A to B uh, with one ticket. Um, and the user only have to do one payment. So of course, there are a lot of complexities connected to this. Um, for instance, the routing of payments to the different service providers. Uh, but all of this is handled by, uh, by Entud and it's beautifully hidden for the end user. And um, funny enough, while I was preparing for this webinar, I received a push notification um, on my phone. You see this, this is a screenshot from my phone just uh, a couple of hours ago, so, so that's why you can see my kid in the background there. Um, the National Railroad Service of Norway, V, uh, they announced that I can now order a taxi using their app uh, to, get, uh, to get to or get from my train trip as simple as possible. And this also, it's another example of uh, what we are doing because one year ago, they also had a um, cooperation with um, electric uh, scooter company. Uh, so you can, you can use your train ticket to also get access to ride a scooter um, from where you are to get to the closest uh, train station, removing the barriers for their customers. So um, how can we make sure that mobility systems of tomorrow actually can become intermodal and personalized, convenient and connected? From a payment perspective, uh, we at Neo Wallet have discussed several use cases. Um, I could probably talk about that for hours, but given some time restrictions, I'll keep it to uh, two of the main use cases that we see. Uh, but of course, if anyone's interested in continuing that conversation, you can feel free to reach out. Um, the first, the first, let's call it obvious use case uh, is payments payments done from the car or in the car. Um, and we see that the users should, should be able to easily add their card by tapping their, their payment card to the dashboard of the card uh, and get it connected to the user or, or um, adding it in the, in the um, mobile application they have that they use to, um, to control the car. And this should be done in order to enable invisible payments friction-free over the air for, for um, many purposes. It could be to pay for gas um, or for electrical car charging. 
Um, or you could uh, you could maybe when you stop by um, the, when you stop by a gas station that also offer washing services, you can you could buy a ticket to the washing machine from from inside the car and and, and get um, the codes that you can use on the washing machine straight from uh, from the dashboard of your car car. Um, or it, it can be used to pay for in-car experience, video demands, apps, even car upgrades. And expanding to that, it's actually also possible with, with today's standard that the car can actually perform a payment over Bluetooth, um, enabling, enabling some cool experiences such as, for instance, drive-through shopping. Um, where you don't even have to go out from the car and, and expose your card or your PIN to, to perform the payment because the payment can be done and authorized from within your car. And another use case uh, that we find quite interesting is actually to um, use the car technology as a car key. Uh, because the, the car technology is, is a proven is a proven technology for identifying and authenticating um, a transaction or or, or an action, uh, which is pretty much also what you want to do in order to enter your car. And um, you could you can in theory you could actually um, issue uh, key cards from the car application. You, you can you can issue that card to Apple Pay or or to the the car's mobile application, and this could be used to unlock the car. Uh, but also it can be used uh, connected with a, a user profile for that card. Um, so you can use it to personalize the seat, the, the driver settings, um, and also the driver experience. And also, um, given the, the security connected to, to car technologies, you can actually use this to, um, to manage access rights. You can have a main key that gives you all the rights uh, within that car, or you can um, push a car uh, card to your... Um, to your friend or, or maybe to your kid who's using your, uh, or borrowing your car, um, where you can limit speed or acceleration, you can limit in-car purchases. Um, you could also, for instance, uh, provide a guest key that can be pushed, uh, where you can also lock the glow compartment or trunk, uh, reduce access to navigation history, um, and looking at, uh, looking at um, car sharing, um, uh, car sharing companies uh, where people are uh, renting out their cars um, the, the virtual the virtual key card can can make that whole experience uh, a whole lot easier and, and a whole lot more secure so one of the one of the key um, key issues or, or um, challenges that that we do see um, also that Declan uh, tapped into was actually how how to realize the potential that lies um, in this field. And from our perspective, the way we see it is that it's important for anyone in this industry not to try to reinvent the wheel, but rather work with established technologies, um, using, using the technologies as uh, building blocks and, uh, and search for cross-industry partnerships to um, to help together to build uh, build the best user experience by combining the the technology that is available. So that's it from uh, from me. Thank you. That's brilliant. Thank you very much, Thomas. Um, I really enjoyed your use cases, and I know you said. Sorry, I apologise. I have a, a poor connection. Um, I'll, I'll keep talking and hope that it just disappears again. This poor connection I have. Um, thank you, Thomas. And I really like the use cases. Um, and I know you said you could talk on for hours and hours about potential use cases. So as you said, your your invitation is there if anyone wants to reach out to you. Um, in use case one, if I could add toll roads. I know there are devices for paying for your toll tags and all that, but they are clunky and you know if you're driving somebody else's car and you suddenly don't have change or you know having it integrated into the car that would be a game changer for me it's always the moment of panic when you hit the barrier and you have no coins <laughs> so um that's certainly one i'd like to see uh, adopted or implemented and um, while i suppose we're moving into the q a section now and while i have you there and you you've just finished speaking um a question specifically for you actually um thomas is 
Is there anybody in the car industry already? No, I lost you, Laura. Or in car, car payments. Um, and if, if, if there are any examples of that. Sorry, I have a really shaky uh, Wi-Fi connection. Um, just on the car payments, can you hear me now? Yeah. Cool. On the car payments, is there anybody actually doing that today? Are, have we got connected cards or in-car payments? Any examples of that at the moment in, in real life? I, I think um, uh, not to a large extent, but again, pointing at Tesla, they, I'd say they are the closest one uh, where you can actually, today you can add your, um, you can add a payment card to your profile and you can use that uh, to, uh, you can actually even, you can buy uh, upgrades on your car uh, from the screen. So you can actually make your car faster uh, by clicking a button uh, and well, paying that price. You can enable uh, what they call uh, full self-driving, which is not, well, it's not level five full, uh, full self-driving, but still uh, it can be enabled um, from the car uh, with the card connected. Uh, right. And also if you're supercharging, this can be deducted automatically from the card on file. Uh, so I, I think that's at least a glimpse into the future what we will see. So some real James Bond or, or Batman Batman potential there um, for, for what we can do in the future with, with this. And do you, on that same note, do you, do you foresee or can you imagine any additional risk? I know for me, when I use, um, when I'm paying for anything online, I prefer to use, obviously you look for secure payments and, um, but I always have this sense of, is there a potential for somebody to reach into my bank account and, and clear me out, you know? So, um, and I know tokenization can help get around that, but are, are there, Downsides, are there risks? Um, you know, greater connectivity leads to greater risk of hack and, and security breach. Yeah, no, it's, it's, a, it's a valid question and a valid concern. Um, and I think that's, that's the big, that's also why I spent a bit of time talking about tokenization, because the way, the way it's built and the way Visa, MasterCard and Amex have, have been working on this for the past six years or so, um, they've actually managed to, to put the same security as, as you have today with a chip card um, in, in a um, remote commerce transaction. So they've actually managed to, to um, keep the same high level of security, but it still increased user experience. So I, do, I don't see that as, um, as an increased risk. Actually, on the contrary, since um, any transaction with a token is very specific and very limited, so it's easy to... Uh, easy to um, validate and, and um, have more control, basically. Yeah, okay, thank you. And I suppose um, coming back to the other panelists, um, and I'm just, I hope everybody can still hear me. I do apologize for very patchy Wi-Fi. Um, just going back to something that Declan mentioned, and maybe this would be a question, Declan, for you, and, and, and Thomas, you might be able to, to respond to this as well. Given the, the traditional banking, financial services and insurance payment payments, um, the, the the changes that the, the automotive uh, sector is going through as well um, regarding fundamental dis disruption. Do you think that there's an opportunity for greater collaboration? I know that you guys in Mia Wallet are working with Mobica, um, but is there, is there greater opportunity for industry collaboration, thinking of all of the actors and, and players that Marcus alluded to in his ecosystem? Um, what would be your opinions or thoughts on that? From my perspective, Laurie, yeah, I guess for, for both industries, like uh, the, the, the traditional uh, payment system, as, as we all know it and, and experience it, is, is, is so, so large and so complex uh, that it, it will it'll be disrupted by uh, emerging technologies for sure. Uh, but there's an expression that it's, it's too large to reinvent. Uh, so a, a lot of the, the, the innovation uh, will, will need to, you know, seamlessly uh, interact with the existing uh, payment systems. And similarly for the automotive players, uh, of course, their core competencies uh, around um, powertrain uh, and body engineering and design and manufacturing. All those core competencies are still critically important to the industry. And as well as Tesla, we've heard lots of stories about how the journey for them ha has been more challenging on, on, on those aspects and you know, clearly easier for them on the digital side. So for those reasons, I guess it's important that, uh, that the traditional players in both these industries uh, are uh, collaborating together uh, and ensuring that, you know, that they can drive 
uh, innovation that that brings together the two industries in in the right way to enhance you know future um, payments or or mobility experience. Uh, so so yeah, lots of opportunities I think exist. Yeah, and I I, I, um, yeah. <laughs> I I don't have too much to add to, to what Declan said. I I, um, I fully agree. Um, but I think it's also important to keep uh, keep in mind that you have um, the payments industry, which is very much risk and security focused, and you have the automotive uh, industry that is equally so. Um, so you have two, <clears throat> let's call it slow moving industries uh, with, with slow moving players maybe uh, so I think it's important also to uh, to, to uh, reach out cross industries not, not even only in the car industry and, and the automotive industry but also uh, get outsiders um, into collaboration to to help challenge the, the existing views to help speed up uh, because if if it's if it's not speedy enough, someone else will come and and, and solve it. So, so absolutely. Maybe I can add um, something there as well. So, so certainly, like collaboration um, and tries innovation. And if you want to actually tackle these big challenges around mobility, I think there's no way around that collaboration is important. But I think it's also important. I think Declan, what, what you said is basically there's an existing already payment providers, ecosystems, also these different technologies. All of this uh, are, are there, and so uh, it, it's not just a disruption completely. And we we start again, it basically needs to actually transform into that. And that's also why we're talking about architecting and transforming uh, this way into this ecosystem. And I think this is this is important to kind of lead this and, 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 and changing that. And I think standards are very important, particularly when we want to uh, in, increase collaboration, increase uh, exchange and integrating the traditional mobility systems, payment systems into maybe this newer um, a way how we see that so standards are important and also I would not only see the collaboration between industry it's also uh, probably between like the regulators and the public sector like our cities city councils I think that needs to be part of this so we just can't just focus on the car part and, and the individual uh, um, uh, transportation we need to have it integrated into these different modes and and different aspects around this so I think standards and collaboration between all all the stakeholders is important. Yeah, I know, um, Marcus, you and I uh, daily, we are working with different um, stakeholders to try and drive innovation in, in particularly in the payment space and, and then yourself with the smart cities and the um, digital transformation space. Um, and the working group that you've put together in the Innovation Value Institute, uh, looking at the future is certainly one forum uh, through which people can engage and have their voice heard. Um, I can tell by the way you're looking that I'm breaking up again, so I hope that's uh, not a problem. Um, but there are always ways, I suppose, to become involved. There are lots of mechanisms and instruments out there to support collaboration across the, across the world. So you have all of the Horizon 2020 programs in Europe, um, loads of national uh, funding supports in Ireland um, to allow people to collaborate. Um, Marcus, in your experience, what, you know, from a different, uh, for, from one sector into the other, for example, automobile trying to merge and converge with payments. Um, you know, what are the blockers? What are the challenges? How do we get around those to get people to work together? I've mentioned some of the initiatives that you're leading, um, but are there ways to drive this or is it something that has other drivers uh, externally pushing this to happen? Like probably both. Um, like, so I think it's really important to think about how do we actually, if you think this goes in this way, how do we actually drive this and enable this? So, and you said basically, so there are blockers and basically technology might be one, but I think we can come overcome that with standards, with interfaces and, and uh, technology will, 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 will be enabling this. But I think also kind of maybe organizational boundaries might be a, a blocker. And But I fully believe, and that's what also that, um, that the group on the Innovation Value Institute around mobility 2025, uh, shows that if you bring stakeholders together and actually discussing a vision for 2025 and basically seeing a direction around this, that actually people working together towards this, the people who at least to 
uh, believe and think this is the, 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 the way, way forward. And then it actually enables uh, collaboration and also research. So what I'm saying is, I think it's important to not lose that uh, direction vision of, of a certain area, in that case mobility, uh, out of the site and actually working towards this. And then we can really truly architect an ecosystem and making it better for everyone. So basically, and, and I think it's an interesting thing to think about how business model change, how roles different changes, so how industry changes. So uh, the, the, the commerce in the car is an important aspect. So who would have thought about that, that actually the platform, the interface in the car becomes the commercial uh, the, uh, aspect around the, the commerce. So that we have a retail store in the car. Uh, all of this is, is very important, but this needs a little bit of vision, leadership around it, and actually a lot of discussion around these groups and the different stakeholders. And of course, uh, like funding support and I think in Ireland in particular I think we have uh, a, a very good uh, funding structure between and collaboration between industry universities and also the public sector the cities uh, around it and for example Laura, the, the fintech fusion um, uh, spokes and, and funding program what you're leading uh, is, is one example from it so it's always kind of uh, um, um, different funding sources. So for example, in that case, it comes from Science Foundation Ireland, industry, and I think that enables a lot of collaboration, discussion, and bring it forward. Mm -hmm. Yeah, thank you. Um, so I suppose there's a, a question back to, to you, Thomas, maybe, maybe Declan as well, you might contribute to this. There, there's a lot of innovation in mobile payments and tokenization, areas like blockchain, and they fundamentally challenge the structure of traditional payments. So would you see that any of this has potential to significantly replace the payment industry as we know it? Um, and how do you see those capabilities being integrated into automotive for it as an example? Yeah, <laughs> it's, a, it's a great question. I, um, it's something we we're discussing ever so often. Um, um, yeah, with, with colleagues here and, and, and with customers and with Visa, MasterCard. Um, we see that there are a lot of huge changes in um, uh, in the payment industry. Um, also, with blockchain, as you mentioned, but in PSC two for the, for those who, who uh, know that. Um, what I think we're seeing is simply that payments will be will be digital. We will be moving quicker away from cash, and and we will be uh, able to. Um, to do remote commerce more easily and more secure than before, uh, whether that's on blockchain or, or direct debit or card rails, uh, I think it's too early to say. Um, but in general, I think that um, payments will be more digital and more available. Um, and that's what's also going to be seen in, in for instance, the automotive uh, industry is that, that the payments will be a more integrated part of the experience and hopefully also more invisible. It should be a non-event. Payments is interesting to no one except us working in the industry. I can add um, to, to what Thomas uh, has said and uh, to totally agree with what everything that you said, Thomas. Uh, I guess if you, if you kind of think about the, the, the nature of the, the, and the extent of the change and transformation that we're gonna see, particularly around uh, autonomous vehicles. Um, it's such a, a complex uh, ecosystem, uh, as Marcus uh, articulated, um, involving you know, a whole multitude of, of private and public players. Uh, so by its very nature, it's decentralized uh, and will involve massive uh, amounts of, of communications and, and generation and exchange of data um, and that's the nature of an ecosystem versus a, a monolithic uh, system. And, and I suppose the challenge for the traditional industry is that it has come from more of a monolithic uh, type approach, if you like. So, so the future world will, will require decentralized systems, whether they're architected around uh, blockchain or just a computer or whatever the, the, the technology uh, is used, it will ultimately need to, to fit in with uh, existing systems. Uh, so it's very much uh, evolutionary. Uh, some aspects uh, may uh, get replaced, uh, but ultimately uh, I think it's, it's going to be more evolutionary 
rather than you know a significant displacement uh, of what we see and experience today. Okay, thanks. Um, I'm looking at the clock. We've about five minutes left, so I have a one. I have another question. I'd just like to put to all three of the panelists. Um, mentioned earlier in one of the presentations was this concept of mobility as a service, um, and I would just like to see if if any of you have an opinion on how you measure the success of mobility as a service. Is it objective? Is it subjective? How do we know what success looks like? I Personally, I feel like it's an ever-moving target. And as you've just said, Declan, it's an evolution rather than a revolution. There may not be a point where we say job done. Um, but I suppose what would be the kind of things you would look at as metrics for success or, or, or implementing mobility as a service and being able to measure its, um, its performance as we go along? I think from, from my perspective, it would be a bit like what, you know, Tom has highlighted that customer experience is, is the number one metric. And, and, and I think uh, that that will be uh, a challenge in, in mobility as a service settings uh, where you have uh, shared assets. Uh, and, you know, uh, when you have different customers, you have different, uh, of course, you have different levels of customer expectation. Um, and we see how Uber uh, manages uh, this by kind of stratifying uh, the levels of, of services that, that are offered uh, through, uh, through its app uh, and the, the, the driver ecosystem that supports their platform. Um, I think that's going to be one of the, the big uh, challenges is to, you know, how do you manage um, customer expectations and, and deliver uh, you know, high levels of customer service. Uh, and then, of course, I, I spoke a little bit about the challenge around uh, COVID. Uh, at least the researchers uh, appear to be uh, highlighting that uh, COVID um, presents some challenges for the notion of, uh, of car sharing, uh, ride sharing, uh, because, of course, if you are compliant in terms of uh, trying to uh, mitigate contagion, you would uh, have a requirement to to to, to really uh, deep clean uh, vehicles, um, you know, at specific intervals and probably some level of uh, of sanitising after every journey. So there there are challenges for sure, uh, and I think it, it will take some time to, to figure that out. But number one, I would say it's going to be uh, matching of experience with with different and varying customer expectations. Okay. Uh, Marcus or Thomas, anything you'd like to add before we, we wrap? Yeah, so, so um, measuring of, of mobility, mobility as a service, of course, that's a huge uh, mm -hmm. uh, challenge. So what do we want to measure? So I would agree with Declan, it's basically like customer experience, um, uh, that it's really a service on the end, a valuable service. But also, of course, there are other aspects. So for example, also an environmental impact and the trade-offs between that. And, and uh, also, uh, of course, that mobility delivers what it actually says. So basically, of course, course uh, work and, and now with the remote working you might have changed a little bit but we still will after the COVID crisis go back to offices again and so we will live somewhere else then we work somewhere so there's a lot of mobility demand and we're only talking about the uh, uh, the, 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 the personal uh, um, uh, transportation or, or mobility. There's also the cargo, the goods uh, transportation around uh, that. So that's also in that picture. So it's a lot of different aspects what we can measure. So overall, I think it's basically that mobility, mobility as a service delivers what it says. So to with low or no uh, environmental impact um, and, and basically an affordable way of mobility and that we have that convenience as a customer perspective. So I think these are at least three aspects which we need to think about somewhere on the resources and environmental impact and on the other side, balancing that with customer experience and customer uh, convenience. Okay, and Thomas, last word to you. I think, uh, I think yeah, what uh, Declan and Marcus have said um, covers it quite well. Um, it, it's, a, it's a difficult metric to measure. Um, how, how do you say if, if Google or Facebook are successful? Uh, it's, uh, um, yeah. But yeah, I think uh, they, they, uh, they provide a good answer. Yeah, okay, thank you. Okay. Well, look, I would like to thank um, I would like to thank our speakers, Marcus and Declan and Thomas. Thank you very much for some really interesting presentations and specifically and your your comments and, and insights in the discussion we've just had. Um, I'd also like to thank um, Paul, Carol, 
um, and Michael for uh, in the Innovation Value Institute for, for, for running this program. As I said at the start, this is one of a series of webinars um, and the next one I can see here is, is planned for the 3rd of September, so not too far away. It will be uh, organizational agility and digital transformation and hot off the press, the speakers will be Kevin Empey from Work Matters and Jean Cushion from the Maynooth University School of Business. Um, you can also sign up to the um, newsletter um, and then there are the usual uh, Twitter and uh, LinkedIn um, and web uh, portals there as well to, to remain in touch. Um, so thank you very much to, as I said, our speakers, our facilitators um, and to everyone who's registered and attended for your interest and for the questions that were shared. Um, it's been a really interesting session and I'm looking forward to the next one. Thank you.